So, now let's proceed with the preface. This is the first preface. Because as I said, uh, there are two prefaces because there are two editions. There's a preface for the first edition and there's a preface for a second edition. Let's proceed with the first edition. Quote, <clears throat> Human reason has the peculiar faith in one species of its conditions that it is burdened with questions which it cannot dismiss since they are given to it as problems by nature of reason itself but which it also cannot answer since they transcend uh, every capacity of human reason. Alright, let's try to flesh this out. Kant, uh, in this passage, tries to introduce a central problem of his philosophy. Uh, and this central problem is the peculiar fate, quote-unquote, of human reason. What's this fate of human reason that Kant is talking about? He argues that a reason is burdened with questions that it cannot dismiss. Okay? So it's burdened to ask some questions that it just cannot avoid asking. As these questions are inherent to the nature of reason itself. So anyone who has reason is forced right, to ask this question. So that's the peculiar faith of uh, human reason. That it's bound to ask these questions. However, that same reason which compels man to ask these questions is incapable of answering those questions. Okay. So, uh, however, at the same time, Human reason cannot answer these questions because they go beyond the abilities and uh, the capacities, the limits of human reason itself, of human cognitive abilities. Can suggest that this situation is a fundamental challenge for a human knowledge understanding, right? As it places inherent limits on what we can know and understand from the world. The questions that are beyond our cognitive capacity may include, for example, the existence of God and so on, but uh, Kant will be talking about that later. So by highlighting the limits of human reason, Kant is setting the stage for his larger project of exploring the nature and limits of human knowledge. He is suggesting that our understanding of the world is inherently limited and that we need to be aware of these limitations in order to gain a more accurate understanding of reality. Right? So sometimes we uh, assume that uh, the human mind can know all things, right? as though we're omniscient, as though we can have a God's eye view, a spectator view of uh, things. But uh, is that really true? No. So in the interest of the common good, Kant is trying to wrestle with this question. So let's return to the text. Human reason has the peculiar faith, right, in one species of its conditions. So notice here the nuance. There's a particular species of its conditions that Kant is trying to uh, focus on. And basically, we can read, uh, we can see what he's talking about in the title. He's talking about pure reason. So, in one species of its conditions, wherein only reason is the, is being relied on, apart from experience, apart from empirical uh, data, which could uh, regulate the synchronicity, the, the, sorry, the spontaneity of the human mind, right? If you rely on your reason alone, on pure reason, that's when you will go wrong. Okay? So that's what the, the species of his conditions that Kant is trying to uh, argue uh, argue is uh, problematic. Okay? So human reason is the peculiar fate in one species of his conditions that it is burdened with questions which it cannot dismiss. So what questions are these like? For example, the existence of God, like, right? Almost everyone wrestles with this question. Does God exist? What does he want from us? Uh, how should we follow his commands? And so on. These are questions that uh, the, the human reason itself is bound to ask. And this, Kant argues, relies on reason alone, on pure reason. So, since they are, uh, it is burdened with questions which it cannot dismiss, since they are given to it as problems by the nature of reason itself, but which it also cannot answer. So, how does Kant prove that these questions cannot be answered? For example, regarding the existence of God, Kant argues that uh, there are atheists as well who have, who have good reasons for their uh, positions. Yeah, for example, Graham Oppie in the contemporary context. So, uh, there are also theists who have good arguments for their position. You can have, cite, for example, uh, Dr. Richard Sinburn, Dr. Rasmussen, Pacer. 
So uh, basically, we have the same. Uh, we, we have different sets of people who use the same reason, but arrive at different conclusions. Why is that so? Kant is trying to argue. He's tracing the problem to what these people are assuming. Right? They are assuming that the human mind on its own is capable of answering those questions. And that's what he's trying to refute. Right? He writes, he, he writes, since they are given to which are problems by the nature of reason itself, right? So the human reason itself, for example, uh, tries to think that uh, some such and such thing exists to explain some phenomenon, right? But then, uh, by raising the problem, it is incapable of answering that problem, of solving the problem. Why? Quote, since they transcend every capacity of human design. So that's what I like about Kant. Sometimes he, 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 he is very explicit about his thesis, right? But uh, that's not always the case, but let's just enjoy that as of the moment because at this point is very clear.